It's such a beautiful day today. It's right at the end of September as well. I think it's like 23, 24 degrees today. So it's a beautiful day. And of course, what better thing to do in the last of the gorgeous weather than to get down here by the sea. I'm actually picking up the threads of a walk I did about three and a half years ago that ended at Thorpe Bay here, just along the coast, well, just along the Thames Estuary from South End. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep walking out to the end of Shoebury Ness, which, as some of you will know, is actually controlled by the Ministry of Defence. It's a highly restricted area. And we'll see, hopefully, the beginnings of what's known as the deadliest path in Britain. This is interesting and perhaps a little bit of a foretaste of things to come. It says, caution, Mulberry Harbour, do not get cut off, know your tides. The Mulberry Harbours were like the harbours that were used to help with the D-Day landings, the floating harbours. I guess there might still be some of it left out here in the Thames Estuary, at the end of the Thames Estuary. these fantastic painted beach huts along the beach here, which is really lovely. Well, that's, that's a really good sign. I just um, bumped into somebody who came up to say how much they enjoyed the videos. Thank you very much for coming and saying hello and saying that. It's really appreciated. And they also said that I'm in for a real treat. I'm going to love the garrison, the army garrison at the end of the estuary here. Ministry of Defence Land, restricted area. I had to call a number this morning to see whether they would be using the artillery range. So I'm not entirely sure whether today's walk is going to get interrupted by artillery fire. That's quite an unusual thing to happen on a walk. I can honestly say it's never happened to me before on a walk. Um, and there'll be red flags flying indicating whether you can go on to the range area. But I think it's still quite a lot of walking we can do without going on to the range. Uh, so this is one of the many kind of restricted wild places of Britain and like I say it includes the most dangerous path in the whole country, the broom way that leads out to Foulness Island. Now in case some of you might be thinking I'm going to be walking that, I am not even going to think about walking that. You need a guide otherwise which you can get cut off by the tide, swallowed by the quicksand and meet an unsavoury end. So the tide's obviously in here. So there's not much beach to walk along. But to be honest with you, it's such a pleasure to walk along any beach, any amount of beach at all, at the end of September in glorious sunshine. So here we see the red flags flying at full mast, which means that the uh, artillery firing range is in use. And they did tell me on the phone that it would be in use until half four. But it means that Gunners Park over there is out of bounds and we may find some of the rights of way on the um, Military of Defence land uh, out of bounds today. I know some people like to challenge the idea that there is restricted land that you can't access anywhere you want to go. And I think, though, when you're being uh, prevented from accessing an area because they are firing heavy artillery, that's a good reason to stay away from that land, to stay off that land. Apologies, by the way, if you see my eyeline straying there it's because i'm using a new camera today which i've never used before so there may be a few things that go wrong and it's got one of those sort of flippy out screens at the side so 
it's very easy to let my eyes go that way. I'll try not to. I'll try and keep my eyes on you. It's right down the lens. Shubriness uh, radio site here and the Coast Guard, but people seem to be going in here. I wonder why. Do the locals know that it's okay to access the site? So it seems as if Gunners Park here is accessible. People are certainly going along there. And the information board here says that there's been human habitation here for 10,000 years. Evidence of Methylistic occupation, Romans, there's Iron Age salt workings here. Well, I asked a lady who was riding her bike through the gate, and I assume it must be local if she's riding a bike around here. She said she didn't even know what the red flags were for. <laughs> so there you go. Let's, uh, I suppose we'll wait and see what happens. There's been a military garrison here since the 1840s. It's still a huge area, completely owned by the Ministry of Defence, all the way around to Foulness Island. A big chunk of the coastline and the sands that lie off it. Unfortunately, I don't know if you had to hear it on the audio, but that radio mast there is alive with birds, all cheeping and chirping away. They occasionally peel off in a great big flock and then regather on the spars of that radio mast. There you go, look, public use of this section of the beach and foreshore is prohibited at all times. And down there, that's the name of the private company who uh, actually operate the artillery firing range here and manage the uh, garrison. Here we go. Ministry of Defence, property access prohibited by MOD bylaws. Danger, do not touch any military debris. It may explode and kill you. Pretty unambiguous. And of course, the other significance, and you might say the real significance of this walk is going out right to the end of the Thames estuary, where the Thames meets the sea. What a magical place that is, right out on Shoebury Ness. Right near the beginning of the Second World War, a German magnetic mine was dropped right at the mouth of the Thames. And uh, this fellow went out there on his own and recovered it. Actually, I don't know if he was on his own, but there's one guy named in the recovery of this huge magnetic mine, which had been a very dangerous undertaking. So they were able to uh, take it apart and decipher how it worked, and they reckon that saved a lot of ships during the Second World War. I don't know about you, but something really takes hold of me when I get out to the end of an estuary and see the sea stretching beyond. See if there's a ship heading out to sea. I just want to go, <laughs> go out over the horizon. So this is Gog's birth. We're one of two barges, Gog and Magog, operated from this wharf here. Fantastic names, obviously named after the legendary giants of old Albion. The ever helpful information boards actually tells us that Gog's Pier was built in 1877. It was used for uh, landing railway mounted guns during the late 1800s. It's incredible. So this shows us some of the sites up ahead. We are here by Gog's birth. I'm going to go around experimental casements. I don't know what they are. And we've got a gun pit here, drill shed, quick firing battery, beach houses, tennis courts and officers mess as part of the military garrison. This is the, uh, the gun pit, the first gun pit here. 
see people enjoy it as a place to gather and go fishing, which is a lovely repurposing. The great nature writer Roger Deakin noted that the wildest places in Britain are completely occupied by the military. The wildernesses of Britain are under military occupation. All the wild places are used for military uses, for either like here, a testing range. He was writing about Orford Ness, which is now is a nature reserve, but until not that long ago it was completely closed to the public. And there are thousands of acres of land of the United Kingdom that are restricted to the public. You can't access them. And they're for the sole use of the, of the military, which is a sobering, sobering view of the landscape of Britain, isn't it? This is the gun battery. You can imagine the uh, military personnel in there with their guns trained out to sea, waiting for a German fleet to appear on the horizon. I'm not entirely sure what the intended purpose of this here is. This concrete lookout. It's great that these places of have been preserved, these places of concrete and pig iron, real vestiges of, of a former world that isn't actually that long ago. It's within my dad's memory, the world of these places. And yet in so many ways it feels very, very distant. Makes me think of the writings of George Orwell. He described the coming of this world in the 1930s very well through to obviously his more famous books like 1984. This part of the shore now is closed off for a section, so I have to turn inland and walk through the garrison. So according to the information board, these houses here date from the mid-19th century, the 1850s, and they're known as the beach house or the beach houses. Over there, on the far side of this park here, we have the Commandant's House, dating from a similar period, and somewhere around here we have the remains of an Iron Age camp. We must find, I think it's just there on the other side of the tennis court. So I think this here is the bank of an Iron Age camp. It was originally called the Danish camp because they thought it was part of the defensive works built by the Danish commander Heston. Which any of you who have watched The Last Kingdom will know of Heston. It's actually one of my favorite characters. But then they did some excavations and it revealed that this was actually Iron Age dating from between 300 and 1000 BC. And there were roundhouses and a settlement here. This is looking down from the uh, embankment of the earthwork. And then right beside the earthwork, you have the, uh, the powder magazines, the Victorian powder magazines. Echoes of history reverberating through the time, They're constantly drawn back to the same places. along the seafront here, which is lovely, right near Shubriness Station. And my aim now is to get to Wakering Stairs so I can at least see the Broomway. It's a little way to go, it's a little bit awkward to get there. We can't just go around the coast, I don't think. This is Shubriness East Beach. Nearly all the benches here have flowers attached to them. Obviously in memory of people that used to sit on this bench where this was their favorite spot. So this is the uh, defensive boom that stretches right out into the estuary. And it goes, I think it goes for about a mile. It's incredible to see it stretching all the way out there 
course, the mouth of the estuary here is very, very wild. I've put the, uh, I've put the distance on the screen if I can find it. But essentially, you feel like you're at the sea. Because out there, you're looking out into the North Sea. And here we have now finally hit the uh, perimeter fence of the Ministry of Defence land. Um, I think there is a, a public right of way on the other side of this section here. We have to walk all the way sort of inland to a village called Wakering and then out towards the uh, Wakering Stairs. I love the, uh, the military bylaws here. I meant to read these before coming out, but um, I didn't. So. You've actually got a train line here. You can see it down here, and this is a level crossing. I wonder if Jeff Marshall's done something on this little railway here. Obviously just here to serve the, uh, the military brace, the firing range. So we're going to go along this residential street here and then another residential street, and then hopefully we'll find a footpath that will take us down to Wakering Stairs and the start of the most deadly footpath in Britain. Entering Great Wakering. Now for a bit of road walking. Kind of all the beautiful beaches and the seaside walks without a little bit of this, I guess. We want to head for a place called Cupid's Corner in Great Wakering. There doesn't appear to be a, a footpath this way, so I wonder whether this track here is the way to go. Uh, there is a footpath here, which is just as well, given the way that people are driving. Unfortunately, it looks as if the footpath ends just there, on a bend. And given the way that people are driving down here like lunatics, I think I'm going to take the safer but slightly longer route. I mean, that car was driving at a moderate speed, but the others have been <laughs> using it like a racetrack. Wow. What a great path to be walking in the hour before sunset. Sunset tonight is at 6.53. I think now it's uh, 5.38. It's about an hour and a quarter until sunset. The evenings have really drawn in in September. They suddenly, you go from these lovely kind of nine o'clock sunsets and before you know it, it's dark by just after seven. So that's fine. I should get there in time for the sunset and just have to walk back in the uh, I just have to walk back in the dark. This is Great Wakering Village. You just we walked a bit of the England coast path there. And look, this butcher sells English rabbits 6.99 each. Here's the high street. So I hope at the end of this high street is another road, and I think from that other road there's a footpath to the Wakering Stairs. The village chippy over there looks very tempting. St Nicholas, Great Wakering. I'll stick my neck out and say that's a very old church. I'd say that could be a Norman church. Well, it's encouraging that it's part of the England Coast Path. And it's going to take us down over Wakering Common to the sea. The Broomway earns its moniker of the deadliest path in Britain because at least a hundred people have lost their lives trying to walk along the Broomway. Even the Ordnance Survey map gives a stark warning that you shouldn't attempt to walk this path without local guidance. It cuts across a stretch of sandbank, mud and sand, and it's a narrow strip of, of hard sand. They don't know exactly what makes it that way, but it's a part of the sand off the shore that you can walk along. And once upon a time, it was the only access to Foulness Island into the 20th century, I think until the 1930s when they put a land bridge over there. 
So that was the only way you could get there. And it earns its name because the course of the path was marked out with brooms that were stuck in the sand so you could find the navigable route across the waters there. It's a, a path of legend and somebody did actually suggest that I should walk it, which is uh, strongly ill-advised unless you have a local guide, someone that knows the exact time of the path, knows, knows the times of the tides as well, very important, <laughs> and can guide you that way. So I'm just gonna go down and actually see this legendary path. I should get there by sunset. It's, just, it's six o'clock, sunset's just under an hour. So uh, we've got to enter the MOD estate. I've just got to make sure I can get back through the gate. So the road is open. I can carry on a mile down here to the stairs. I had to check with the security guards there, but I'm able to, to get back through that gate. And they said, yeah, the gate won't be shutting till the early hours of the morning, which is good. There was a bus in the lay-by back there. And I thought, oh, as soon as I'll be coming back in the dark, thought <laughs> maybe I can get a bus. So I said to the guy, the bus driver was there, I said, all right, mate, what time are you heading back? And he laughed, he looked at me, he laughed, but mate, you got, you got more chance of getting a train at Hogwarts than you have <laughs> of getting a bus from here. And he said, it's something to do with, he said, because of the situation at Asda. And I think the, the, uh, the buses refuel at Asda. And he said, due to the, the fuel shortages caused by the shortage of HGV drivers, I think, there's a two hour queue to refuel at the local Asda petrol station. So the buses are under instructions to only run every few hours. So they get, have to wait and get told when it's okay for them to, to head out again. Welcome to Britain 2021. It's a very long path this. Must be one of the most uh, unusual roads that I've ever walked along. But what a beautiful time of day to be here. Half an hour till sunset. Strange to think of this road here, leading straight out to sea. I don't think I've ever anticipated the end of a road and the beginning of a path as much as I have this one. I think this is such a, a point laden, well, with danger <laughs> for a start. I mean, either side of me are artillery batteries that thankfully aren't in use at the moment, but also as, like I say, a path of legend, a path where people die if they go out at the wrong time and they don't know their way, that could be it. Not many other places like that in the UK. Oh wow, this is incredible. Can you hear the birds out there? Here it is, the Broomway, a path that leads out over the Maplin Sands. The writer Robert McFarlane walks the Broomway in his book, The Old Ways. Let's be very careful here, slippery, slippery path, because the tide washes over the path here. And he recounts the story of a coachman in the 19th century and the coachman would wait at an inn back there, I think in Great Wakering, until the tides were ready for them to be able to pass over the Broomway to Foulness Island. And this coachman, he set off, and whether he got his times wrong, whether he had a glass too much ale before he set off, didn't make it to the other side. When they went to look for him, there was no sign of the horses at all, the carriage was turned upside down on the sands and next to it was his drowned body. This was a coachman who used to make that journey on a regular basis. The thing is, what happens, is it's very easy to become disorientated out there on the sands. People think they're heading towards 
land and in fact they're heading out to sea. Sometimes the lights on the Kent coast down there get mistaken for the lights on the shore this way where you're heading. Before you know it, you've gone out into the sands, you get stuck in quicksand, stuck fast, and the tides rush in faster than a person can run. Faster than a person can run. That must be absolutely terrifying to be stuck out there in the mud and see the tide rushing in. The other thing that happens to people is they set off across the broomway and suddenly a mist descends and they're completely lost. They have no idea where the path has gone. And they're out there on the sands, surrounded by wet sand, mud, quicksand, and mud that will s swallow you up. And you've no idea where the path has gone in the mist. It must be absolutely terrifying. That's why I'm not even considering walking out there. I don't think I'd even do it if I had a guide, to be honest with you. <laughs> it sounds like a crazy thing to do. But it's also, what an, <laughs> what an amazing location. Hats off to Robert McFarlane for giving it a go. His guide in the end had to pull out, but he sent him instructions with coordinates and compass bearings and all sorts like that. Otherwise, <laughs> no chance. And here it is, the deadliest path in Britain. I've got to make my way back along that road now in the in the gloaming which would be absolutely delightful somehow i'll get my way back to, <laughs> to shoebury ness to get the train back to london i think i'm going to sign off here i've still got a little bit of light very soon it'll be pitch black and i'm going to drop back down into that kind of marshy area there so i don't think the light will be very good i'll include some bits of that on the on the uh for the end credits if you like what an amazing spot to be. It's a shame I couldn't have got here earlier because you can see there's a path that carries on along the sea wall here, but I don't know whether you have to just come back here. So I can already see the sun setting on the other side of the village there. Thank you so much for coming on this amazing walk with me out to the Broomway, out to Wakering Stairs. And forgive me for not walking over Britain's deadliest path. As I always like to say, I look forward to seeing you on the next walk, wherever that may be. And I didn't foresee me coming down here two days ago. So who knows where it'll be. Could be, could it be any, I mean, I should stop saying it'll be anywhere. It's going to be somewhere close to London, isn't it? But who knows? Take care. Have a great week. Just as I suspected, that bus is no longer here. Maybe the Hogwarts Express is more frequent than we thought.